All right, all my middle school kids, hold up your notebooklets. Do you have them? All right, in middle school, we take notes on everything. And so I told them that today if I'm preaching, they better be taking notes today also. So I'm watching. I'm going to make sure that we're, we're good with this. For time's sake, we're going to jump right into it here. Most of you have heard the story of, uh, of Jacob's ladder. We teach our, That's one of our kids' stories that we teach. You know, Jacob had just stolen his brother's birthright. He was kind of running for his life. He was afraid his brother was going to kill him. His dad said, don't marry somebody here. Go home and find a wife from there. So he's traveling down a deserted desert road. The sun goes down, it gets dark, and he pulls up a nice comfy rock, and he lays down to go to sleep on this rock. While he's asleep, he has a dream or a vision where a ladder comes down, angels are going up and down, the Lord is standing at the top, and begins to talk to him and gives him a prophecy of his future. And it's a good one. Things are looking really good. And then, and this is the part that really struck me, at the end of it, he woke up, it said, uh, when, then Jacob woke up and he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, but I did not realize it. When I read that, I thought, how many times do we find ourselves, maybe not the prophecy of our great future, but how many times are we in a place where we recognize that God was there and, and, and we didn't even know it? Or even worse, how many times have we gone through a situation God was there and we never knew it? Even to this day, we still, still don't know that God was there. My fear is that a lot of times in our lives, we don't recognize God when He's present. There was uh, an experiment some scientists did. They took a, a bush and put it in the middle of a sidewalk and they covered it with money, uh, enough money that it, was, it would draw your attention. And then they watched people as they walked down the sidewalk. Most people, of course, had phones, and they were on their phones. And they found out that these people would walk down the sidewalk, they would get to the bush, and they would go around the bush, so they knew it was there, but they had no idea that the bush was covered with money. Somehow, they were aware of its presence, but they, they had no clue about what it really was. They called this inattentional blindness. And yes, that, that is the word. I had to keep going back and making sure that it was spelled right and looked right. Inattentional blindness. It's described as the failure to notice a fully visible and unexpected object because attention was not engaged, because intention was engaged on another task, event, or an object. They went right by it, not even realizing what it was because they were too focused on something else. I think that we can suffer from spiritual inattentional blindness. Here's what I describe that as. It's the failure to notice God's presence and His unexpected work because attention was focused on a busy life, a difficult event, or material things. How true that is for so many Christians. That God is right in front of us, He's doing something amazing, and yet we're so busy that we walk around God and we go on with our life. I fear that, that way too often that is a description of my life. I think, and I tell our middle schoolers all the time, I fully believe that, that a thousand times a day, God tries to reveal Himself to us. Every single day, a thousand times. He's either giving us direction, He's giving us advice, He's showing us what to do, He's trying to protect us, to guide us. And yet, somehow... We make it through the whole day and we don't see any of those thousand times. If you were to ask me on most days, how many times did you see God, I would uh, start counting and would come up with zero. I would end up at the end of most days and I would say, oh, I don't really know what God did today. I'm not sure that I really saw what He did. It, and I believe it is never because God didn't do anything that day. It's always because I didn't see the thousand things that God did for me during that day. Some examples of spiritual uh, inattentional blindness. Balaam and his donkey. We know that one. Uh, there was an angel there ready to kill Balaam, and Balaam had no idea. The donkey even saw it. And then the donkey talks to him, and he had no clue that how strange it was that a donkey was talking to him. Or the disciples that are walking with Jesus after the resurrection. They were walking with him, carrying on a conversation. And it wasn't until right at the end that they said, wait, this is Jesus here. Imagine that. Or how about the suffering classmate who just needs a little bit of help. 
or the depressed coworker who needs some encouragement? Or what about the sour convenience store clerk who just is having a terrible day and they're taking it out on you? Or the neighbor struggling with loneliness, or a friend who needs direction, an angry friend, or just a normal person you know who really would want to know about Jesus. How many times has God put something in front of us where we have a great opportunity, and yet we were spiritually blind to that? We didn't even realize what God was doing. I, I used to teach third grade, and we, one of my favorite things we did is that we would take uh, our third graders to the state capitol. It was a part of our social studies government unit. And we always would choose to do that on the national day of prayer. So we would be at the center of Tennessee's government on the day when everybody in the nation is praying about the government. It was really a neat experience. We would stand on the balcony at the Capitol and look out over Nashville and we would pray over Nashville. Just, just a, a, a really cool event. Well, you can't line that up until six months before the time, which means when we're starting school, we can't, we can't uh, reserve our time and we have to remember to call them. Well, one year we forgot and we waited way into the year and finally we're like, oh, we haven't lined that up. So I called and they said, sorry, National Day of Prayer. They didn't say National Day of Prayer, whatever that day was. It was, uh, it was booked. There were no openings. And you know, I was, I was upset with God. I thought, God, this, this is such a good thing. I mean, it, it's so exciting to be there on that day and we're able to combine the, the importance of prayer and the study of government and it has such an impact on our students. And I thought, God, wh why would you let that happen? I mean, this would be really good. Couldn't we be there on that day? And so I kind of held this, this little resentment against God because, of, of what, because we didn't get our right day for it. Well, three weeks later, after the National Day of Prayer, we finally had our, our trip to the state capitol. And as we, uh, as we arrived there, we sat down on the steps. Um, they, we, the kids would always start singing. We had to wait for the tour guides to come in to, uh, to, guide us through, to guide us through. And the kids started singing chapel songs. Then, on the other side of those steps, a high school group came in. And they, they had a seat right there next to us. And we were singing chapel songs, and they were kind of paying attention. And the, we had been there long enough, the kids kind of finished the chapel songs, and then they, they began to quote Luke 24. I always liked to teach Luke 24 to our third graders, and they would learn 40 verses. It was really impressive when they would say it. And so one of them just started saying it. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men whose clothes gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed to the ground. And I knew I would forget that part. Uh, <laughs> bowed to the ground. Uh, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, for he has risen. Now they're quoting this on the steps of the Capitol. And they go on for another 30 verses, quoting Luke 24, which is a, a great scripture to know. It is the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as I stood there, I looked at those high school kids who most of them were listening carefully to what these third graders were saying. And it struck me, we were there preaching the gospel on the steps of the state capitol to public school kids who aren't allowed to hear that when they're in public school. We were preaching the gospel there. You see, my schedule was not the same schedule as God's schedule. And for once in my life, God said, wait, hold on, what you had planned? No, I've got something else for you. I was mad about it. I was blind to it. God knew exactly what he was doing. God wanted us sitting on those steps next to that group of, of high school students sharing the message with them. Now, I have no idea what ever came from that. I don't know who those kids were or where they are. But I fully believe that because of the way God arranged that, 
that those somebody there needed to hear that message and that what, what we did on those steps changed the lives of somebody in that group, maybe multiple people. You see, God knows what He's doing. God is in charge. We need to be the ones to say, God, guide us. Don't let us guide you. We need to learn to acknowledge God. Hosea 6.3 says, Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge Him. As surely as, surely as the sun came up this morning, God is going to guide you when you acknowledge Him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. I was trying to lean on my own understanding. Don't do that. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He is going to make your paths straight. When we learn to acknowledge God's presence in our life, God takes care of us. He guides us. He pulls us into His will. So what does it mean to acknowledge God? It means to bring glory to God. When we say, God, you get the glory for this. People need to understand who you are. It means not getting God to walk with us, but, but we walk with God. It's not saying, God, come help me. It's saying, God, let me serve you. It means we are joining in God's work and His kingdom on this earth. That's what acknowledging God is. It means saving souls, redeeming mistakes, seeking the lost, restoring the fallen. It is where God chooses you to be a part of that, which is what happens when we acknowledge God. So how do we acknowledge God? Here's some things that you can do to acknowledge God. You walk with God by actively looking for Him. When we go to Mid Ohio Valley Work Camp every summer, we take our teens there. The first devotional uh, of, of our devotional together is a time where we say, you're going to share your God moments. And we tell them ahead of time, look for God moments. Their first day out there on the uh, working, they are actively looking for what God is doing. They'll come back and share stories of the homeowners that we help and the, the conversations they had and the friendships that they had. A lot of that happens. And that night at the devotional, they're full of stories. A lot of that happens because they are actively looking for God. We need to actively look for God every day of our life. That should be the norm of what you do. When you walk into work, you're actively looking for God here. You're looking for those God stories. You're looking for those opportunities where God is working. Another way to walk with God or to acknowledge Him is by asking Him to open our eyes. Um, at camp this summer, we had one of our lessons was God opening our eyes. And then in middle school, later in the year, we, we studied that again. And we prayed one Sunday morning. We said, God, please open our eyes so we can understand what, what you're doing, so that we can know that you are active in these, these thousands of times a day that you're doing something in our life. And I told them, I said, you watch, God's going to show you something. You're going to see something where God is working. Well, we came back that Wednesday night and we started to share some things. And somebody mentioned that they had woken up in the middle of the night. And I always tell the middle schoolers, if you wake up in the middle of the night, it's because God wants you praying for somebody. And so they woke up in the middle of the night and for some reason, Abby Sowards came to mind. Her parents were out of town and, and they started praying for her. And somebody else in the room got a funny look on their face. They said, same thing happened to me last night. I woke up and I prayed for Abby. Somebody else said, well, I didn't wake up in the middle of the night, but Abby has been on my mind and I've been praying for her. We witnessed how God pulls prayers together. People we don't even realize or we don't even know that they're praying, multiple people praying for the same person. So Nora raised her hand and said, do we need to worry about Abby? And I said, absolutely not. Abby's the safest one here. We've been praying for her. <laughs> It's the other people we haven't been praying for. That's who we need to worry about. But we witness God in the way God works. I think He does that every day. And we just don't see it. And then that next Sunday was what in middle school we call Tatiana's Miracle. That was where uh, Tatiana got very sick that morning and had to go to the hospital and it did not look good at all. And this, this congregation, you all sitting here, prayed for her. And at almost the exact time that you were praying, she started getting better. I think it, it, was, it was a miracle of what God was doing, and it was a testimony to the fact that God works. 
our middle schoolers ask God to open their eyes, and He did. And He will for you. When you start saying, God, help me to experience what you're doing. Let me be a part of what's going on in, in your kingdom. God will open your eyes. He will allow you to start seeing those things that He's doing. Another thing we can do is join God's work. Now, I know that there are some things that we don't accept as God w God's will. There are, there are certain sins and there are certain horrific events. And in a minute, we'll kind of get to that. But accepting what happens is a part of God's plan. Too many times, like me and the kids uh, preaching on the state capitol, too many times we're like, God, that's not what's supposed to happen now. And we need to step back and say, okay. God, whatever you want to do is what we accept. Sonora, uh, at her school, they, they started these houses, like these different clubs where they divided people up, and they were with uh, different ages and different groups, and they, they cast lots to do that. They, they dropped a ball down and it bounced down, and wherever it went is the club you went into. And so Sonora believed that God would put her in the right club, but you know what? She ended up in a club with mostly boys. Can you believe that? She was like... Mostly boys. There was like three or four girls in the club. And she, she thought, this is terrible. And then she thought, no, this is God. It's what God is doing. And so she started to approach that club, not in dread, but in saying, God, what, what are you wanting from me? And she realized that there was one girl there who was very quiet, very shy, had no friends and would hardly talk which meant that there wasn't much of a chance that she was going to make any friends. And Sonora realized that that was, that was why she was there. And, and she began to make friends with that girl. Uh, the girl's a year younger. Since that time, she has made other friends. And I really believe it's because of some moments that Sonora had with her in an all-boys club. A time that, that they could connect God used Sonora because Sonora accepted what, what was happening and said, I will look for God in this situation that I don't like. How many times are we in situations that we really don't like? We don't like where we're ending up, but we need to accept what God is doing and we need to look for God in that situation. Uh, we can join in God's work by acting on what we see. Uh, and I've got to go faster because I'm running out of time. This, those of you who know Bill Smith, you know, we think he's like a secret agent. So this is one of the best pictures we could find of him. It was like a, a secret picture. Uh, Bill Smith is a great servant of God. A couple years ago at camp, we didn't have enough uh, boy counselors. And I sent out an email to all the counselors saying, if you know anybody who could be a boy counselor, we really need some. I, I, I'm not sure what happened. I think I was trying to click on Katie Smith's name and somehow I hit Bill Smith to send the email to. And Bill responded and said, I think I can. I, I'll see. And I was like, you think you can what? Because I'm not connecting this yet. And, I, and, and it took me a little while to realize Bill was talking about camp. And then I was like, well, how did you know about camp? He said, well, you sent me an email. I was like, no, I didn't. I didn't send you an email. I didn't think about you being at camp. But, but he got this email. And Bill said, I, I'm trying to work it out. I'm having a hard time with work. Um, I think I'll make it. He finally called. He said, I worked it out. I didn't find this out till later. His working it out was that he quit. They said, no, you can't leave. And he said, then I quit. He, he felt like uh, the, the email going to him by accident was God telling him he needed to be at camp. And if you know Bill, nothing's going to stand in the way of what he thinks God wants him to do. The great thing about that story is he quit his job as a busboy at Red Lobster and on the way home I think he hitched a ride with Amy Nelson going back home and she just happened to mention that Lipscomb was looking for people with some math backgrounds and Bill ended up working at Lipscomb with a job paying much more than what he was making as a busboy. He chose God over his job and it paid off. We need to join God's work by just acting on what we see, even when, even when we're not sure about how it's going to turn out. We need to bring glory to God by stepping out in faith. 
Um, uh, this was a story about a, a year ago. The middle schoolers just wanted to do something. They didn't know what. We wanted to do some service. I kind of thought we might go to a school and just pray over a school. So we planned out about a month out uh, to just one Sunday afternoon go do something. And during that time, Sue Alban uh, just happened to call and talk to Cheryl and mention that she had a bunch of sticks in her front yard where they cut a tree down and uh, kind of needed those sticks to be picked up before they could mow. Uh, Cheryl uh, contacted us. She said, I think you guys are going to do something. Do you think you could fit this in? And I thought, fit it in? I think that's what we were doing. We just didn't, we didn't know that's what we were doing. And so as after we, after we said we are going to go do something, God said, all right, it's about time. I've got a lot of things. Here's one of the main things you can go do. Sometimes we step out on faith we step out to, to say, God, I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing, but I'm doing this for you. And then God says, all right, it's about time. Here, I've got several things lined up. God will begin to show us what he's doing in this world. What happens when you acknowledge God? Um, I, you know, I was originally scheduled to preach several weeks ago, the 1st of October. Uh, we lined it up in the summer. You know, it's scheduled out through the year. And... And at some point, Stephen came to me, he said, there's a guy coming through, we'd kind of like him to, to preach, could he take your Sunday? And of course, I was like, yeah, that, that's fine. A little bit of me was disappointed, because I thought, well, it's going to be a whole nother year before I, I get to present this lesson, I'd been working on it a while. And, and so I was kind of starting to say, God, and I thought, wait, that's what my whole lesson is about. <laughs> just, just accepting what, what God's, you know, God's schedule. And I said, yeah, God, you're in charge. And I really thought that it would be a whole nother year before I got back on the, on the schedule. But I said, God, just when you're ready for it, then you make sure it happens. Wednesday, uh, uh, Tim Partlow called. He said, there's been a change of some schedules. We need somebody Sunday. Could you preach Sunday? And I was like, uh, I'm not quite ready. But then I thought, oh, ah, this was God's plan. <laughs> God rescheduled what was going to happen. And I told Tim, absolutely. I mean, I don't have a choice, right? God said, Sunday is when you're going to do this. Now, here's the thing. I, I've had a certain boldness in this lesson. You ask Debbie, she, know, uh, she can tell you that I have been scared to death um, about being ready for this. But yet, there's a certain boldness because I know that even if I do a horrible job today, at least one of you... God had planned on you hearing this message. There's somebody here that either wasn't here the last time or for some reason you weren't ready to hear it and God said that person needs to hear it on December 1st. That's when you're going to do this lesson. So you know what? Even if I do a horrible job, God is going to work a miracle and make sure that somebody hears something that they are supposed to have out of this lesson today. So be careful. It might be you. Okay? <laughs> This might have all been for you. But, but knowing that God was arranging that, it creates a boldness. Uh, it, it makes you more watchful. I was much more willing to say, yes, I'll do it uh, Sunday. It makes you more alert. You see more possibilities. And God can trust you. When He can trust you with the little things, He can trust you with bigger things. So once you begin to acknowledge God, and once you begin to believe that God is working, and once you believe that what we're doing is a part of God's kingdom, there is a benefit that, that you get from that. That you know, regardless of whether you stumble and fall and say dumb things, that God can still use those things for His kingdom to glorify uh, what He's trying to do in this world. Now, looking for God in a bad situation... This, this is that one part. Sometimes there are things in life that are just horrible. There are the things that we can't accept that it came from God. And I agree, there are some things that are not from God. Just pure sinness, we know that that is not from God. But, but bad things that happen. So looking for God in a bad situation does not mean that you're giving God the credit for that bad thing or that you're blaming God for that bad thing. Looking for God in a bad situation is you're looking for a redemption of that bad thing. You're looking for where God is in those, in those bad situations. So here's, here's an example of that. Um, 
uh, on June 3rd, 2017, my niece Peyton Chisholm uh, was married here in this building. And you can see the, the guy standing there that I've circled. Um, his name is, is Botham Jean. Botham Jean uh, was a great man of God. Uh, uh, Peyton and her husband met him at Harding. He was a great song leader, uh, very faithful, and a great servant of God. Botham Jean is the, the man who was in his own apartment when an off-duty police officer walked in thinking it was her apartment, and she shot him and killed him. It, it, was, a, it was a horrible, uh, horrible event. Not something that I at all would believe is something that God had planned. And yet, in the middle of horrible events, we still look for God. We still try to acknowledge what God is doing. We still try to take those bad things and pull something out of that that can be a glory to God and that can be an honor to God. And I think that's what Botham Jean's brother uh, tried to do. Um, I want you to watch a, a quick video here. And the, the, the young man's name is Brant Jean. He struggles between the rightful anger of his friends and family about what has happened and understanding where God fits into this situation and where the kingdom of God uh, falls into this situation. Watch this video about how he, you can see him struggling between these two worlds here. I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt, all the things, the bad things you may have done in the past. Each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask Him, He will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I, see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's, what, that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes.
cry every time I see that. In this horrible, horrible situation, he had his eyes on Jesus. He wasn't after revenge. He wasn't even after justice. He was after glory to God. And because of his actions there, when he hugged her and when what he said to her, the, the secular news stations played that all over this nation. People all over this nation heard him saying, you, you, you need to go to Jesus. You need God in your life. Because of his actions in acknowledging God and God's presence, he was able to preach to the entire nation. He had an opportunity that was only there because of what happened. The event, not of God. His reaction, definitely of God. Definitely a glory to, to who God is. Definitely what Jesus would want as we reach out to everyone. Our sinful world causes things to happen that are not a part of God's plan. Nevertheless, we still look for God in even the most horrific events. If He could find God in that, you know that you can find God in the things that we deal with on a daily basis. I thought this was a good quote. When you're in the dark, listen, and God will give you a very precious message for someone else when you get into the light. Look for God in the events of your life. Look for God in somebody else's troubles. Look for God in horrible events. Look for God when you're scared. Look for God when you're troubled. Look for God when your car breaks down. Look for God when somebody else's car is broken down. Look for God in depression. Look for God during excitement. Look for God in everything. All the time. He's there a thousand times a day. And when you see Him, share that God moment with somebody else. A thousand times today. The rest of this day, a thousand times, God is going to try to reveal Himself to you. The question is, are you watching for it? Are you ready for it? We're going to have a time of prayer. The elders are going to come forward. This is a great opportunity for you to bring things for them. Uh, if you come, say, and also, help me to see God. We have elders also in the back. If you don't want to walk down here, walk back that way. Go find somebody there. Uh, you can even go to anybody else, your teacher of your class, any, anybody you want to go to. This is just a great time to pray. Let's glorify God with every moment of our life. Let's glorify God with every part of who we are and everything that we do. Let's, let's praise Him. Lord, I come.